Welcome to another live stream from Emerald Hills Skies in Louisville, Kentucky. Tonight, one of our goals is to see as many targets as possible. So we need to get going. Uh, we're going to go right over to our targeting software and uh, waste not a single other moment. Let's try to go to something like um, Jupiter. Let's go there first. Slewing to coordinates. So that we can do a better plate solve than the wide. Slewing moon. complete. And what we'll do now is maybe have this set on uh, five seconds at. Put it back on 300, why don't we? And do the plate solving. That way we'll get our mount lined up with reality. You know, during plate solving, uh, if you're new to this, uh, to the craft of this hobby, during plate solving, what we do is the, the uh, software consults a library of known images of the night sky, complete with all the stars, you know, located. And then it looks through the telescope. The software is doing all this for us. It compares its view to the, to, coordinates. to the view of the night sky. Slewing and to then coordinates. It them. And you can see we were 3.9 degrees off on the first target. That's typical uh, because we don't do any kind of um, uh, three star alignment with the way we've got this set up. We, we polar align and then we slew to the first target and then we uh, plate solve. And with that plate solving, what typically happens is we align and the rest of the night we're less than a degree off when we plate solve. So here we are, uh, dead set on Jupiter after the plate solve. Now let's let's drop back to maybe um, something like, um, I don't know, a gain of, first let's drop back to a gain of maybe 100 at five seconds and just see if we can get a little bit of a view of the of the planet. You can already see the four moons. Let's uh, zoom in here at, uh, let's go in and go in at 100%. Nice view there of the four, the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's reduce our gain to zero. And that way we'll get rid of that glare off the, off the planet. Another thing I think is interesting Boy, it looks like we can even bring this down to like two seconds. Get rid of that glare. And uh, going down to one second now. That's probably good enough for right now because what we want to do is we want to go over to our uh, planetarium software. And in our planetarium software, what we want to do is we want to sync we want to find jupiter and we want to find out the names of those moons just so you can say that you you saw them let's center on that in our planetarium software we'll be able to zoom in here and it'll show us the exact names of the moons let's uh let's go to our um, info no settings and let's go to uh, solar system and maybe say with names. How about that? Is that what we need to do to see the, the names of those moons? Maybe I can just click on them. So Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede. So that's the order they are from out to in on the three moon side. Somebody remember that for us. Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede. It just so happens that they're in alphabetical order there, aren't they? So now let's go back over to um, our live image. This is now live up in the sky. And you can see now this is Callisto, this is Europa, and that's Ganymede. And then let's go over on the other side and pick up EO. So this is EO here. So with a wide field telescope like the Rasa, that's uh, very typical that we would see those moons. But let's, let's see if we can get a little bit more detail on the planet by actually we're going to reduce the, the exposure a little bit 
and get rid of all the glare or as much of it as we can. We're at zero gain. Let's drop down to um, 300 milliseconds. What we're trying to do is get rid of the glare enough to be able to see some of the detail on the image. Boy, it's just a bright object, isn't it? 100 milliseconds. So you see now we're losing the moon's 50 milliseconds. It's like an auction. There, now you're starting to see, just barely starting to see some of the bands. 25 milliseconds. There you go. Now you can start to see some of the cloud bands there. And uh, for tonight, since we're we're mainly trying to cover a lot of objects, let's um, let's leave it at that. I don't know. We could live stack that and make it better, but I I think probably um, for the purposes of our of our night tonight, since we're trying to cover a lot of objects, let's just leave it at that Jupiter and let's do a snapshot of that and then let's go back up to one second and do another shot that way we'll have those moons okay so that's our first our first object uh, again we're using a, a, a Rasa telescope the Rasa Rho Ackerman Schmidt astrograph Let's go back over to our targeting software now, Astro Planner. Now that we've got our um, sort of uh, orientation to the world, now let's go to the moon. I'm just going to say here on Jupiter, um, I'm just going to say, um, saw all four Galilean moons. And Let's go back to where we were a while ago. And now let's slew to the moon. And I just want to show you how incredibly bright this is tonight. Here's our moon. So let's slew to Slewing to coordinates. Uh, this, this image that you see there is Slewing the complete. live of the scope. So you can see it sort of, you can kind of see it in reference to the sky using that um, scope cam. Mm -hmm. Kind of looks like a piece of our, of our uh, dew. Looks like a piece of our dew shield has come on Velcro, doesn't it? That's odd. We'll um, we'll worry about that later. That might be a, an effect of the camera too. In fact, I think that's what it is, just an effect of the camera. Let's change our target name here in our our software to Moon. Let's go back to SharpCap and let's do a. Um, probably not going to be able to plate solve with this set on five milliseconds or, or one second. Let's change this to five seconds and put that gain on 100 just for a moment. Cancel that. Let's go back out to auto too. There's the moon. <laughs> that's wild, isn't it? It is incredibly bright tonight. That's, that's the condition we're dealing with right now. Um, let's go back to a point well, first, let's plate solve. Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to plate solve the moon. <laughs> Three millis or 30 milliseconds, maybe, at zero gain. Something like that. Now we might be able to plate solve. Get that maybe up more in the center of our target. If you've just joined us, we're operating on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. Looks like we have several folks here. There's Kim down in Australia. And do I say Kana watching from Singapore? Is that how I pronounce that? Kana. And there's Frank. Uh, yeah, Frank 
thank you for joining us. Sorry you're up so late. I know you're in Eastern time zone up there in New York, Schenectady. Um, so you got to go to work tomorrow, Frank. You're not going to be able to stay up all night. Um, there's Joe in Boston just checking in. Welcome to you as well, Joe. We are so sorry we got started late. If you joined us late, uh, we had a problem at first. I don't know if it was just I didn't have the Ethernet, the Cat7 cable plugged in so that it made contact or what. So I carried everything back out of the scope to check that with a shorter uh, Cat5 uh, cable. Everything worked at the scope. So then I knew it had to be a cabling issue. I brought everything back in and, uh, you know, reconnected all the cables. Just must have been not a, a good connection. So uh, then we were live. That was about a 40-minute snafu there if you're joining us late. Frank, it looks like you're uh, camping. Oh, you're off this week. That's outstanding. All right. Well, I hope you don't have to get up quite as early. Um, let's reduce this moon to 10 milliseconds so we can see some degree of... Um, detail there and let's go ahead and zoom in what's a what's an appropriate size for that something like that let's go ahead and drop that to about five milliseconds okay maybe just a little bit more than that seven milliseconds something like that yeah so see, that's the uh, the moon that we're dealing with tonight, and it's just blinding. I mean, when I was standing out there, uh, you don't need a flashlight tonight. It, it's bright enough. So we're going to do a snapshot of this, just so we've got it. And again, go back to our targeting software, and just do a quick observation here, and say... Um, we love the moon. Ha ha, blinding. And then uh, add 99% uh, full. They say this moon is has got a special name. Does anybody remember what it's called? Is it Blue Moon? I forget. And I think that, is this the Blue Moon? I think it comes from, what is the Blue Moon? Is it when you have a... Oh, somebody remind me. Is it the third full moon in a season? Is that what it is? Uh, I think that's when you've when you've got three full moons in one season or something like that. Something completely crazy that has nothing to do with reality. <laughs> uh, and let's go NGC 6992. NGC 6992. These uh, objects are all named. You know, all the all the stars in the sky are basically named by now. If it's not named complete. By the, with an NGC number or, or a, 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 sometimes a, a Gaia number, sometimes it's a Gaia number in the new, the new Gaia survey. This already looks a lot better. But you know what? I tell you, yeah, that's 100%. Let's back off to auto and do one more plate solve here. This is the Cirrus Nebula. Let's go over here to um, our our Sky Safari. This is not a six, 6992 NGC 6992. Oh, well, this is the Veil Nebula. It doesn't say that in my in the in the targeting software. So what we'll do is we'll edit that and add that. We're going to say edit, and under the name, we're going to say Veil Nebula. So we'll add that in. And there is a western portion of this, as you know, and an eastern portion. Sinking to coordinates. Slewing to coordinates. Slewing complete. So let's go back to our sharp cap and let's start live stacking. Clear our last live stack. Now, while that's um, live stacking, let's look back 
at Sky Safari and listen to this audio. NGC 6992 is a bright, wide portion of the famous Veil Nebula in Cygnus. The object is the wreckage of a supernova that must have exploded many thousands of years ago, sending filaments of dust flying away. Also, the expanding bubble is sweeping up the area. On photos, it can be seen that the region within the veil's radius contains more stars than outside since the inner area is swept clean of obscuring interstellar debris. The brightest portion of the nebula can be seen in a small refractor, or even in binoculars, as an uneven texturing and wrinkling in the sky. In larger telescopes, the veil's various sections look like white rope, or even like a torrent of water cascading into nothingness. Older viewing guides emphasize the difficulties of observing the veil, but modern amateurs view these warnings as myths. <laughs> I love it the way they give us these uh, stories, you know, about these objects. Um, it's really large. It's six times the diameter of the full moon. So that's huge. We're supposed to be zeroed in on 6992, NGC 6992. Um, so let's see. 6992 and 6995 are the only parts that can be unmistakably seen in binoculars. 6992 to 95 is the eastern side of the Cygnus Loop. So what has happened is this um, this is basically a supernova that has now been blown out in the middle. Uh, so it is uh, quite a showpiece on a moonless night. Let's see what we can do with it here. Let's see. We'll, we'll first check our... Um, let's first check our... color balance. Let's bring our look at that. This almost has a weird oh yeah, there we go. That's too much of the mids. We use a light pollution filter. Look at the orientation of the scope. You can see that we're we're aimed straight up. I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go back over to Sky Safari for a moment. And in Sky Safari, let's center on that and then back off. Kind of get a picture of where we are in the sky in relation to Where was it now? I've lost it. I guess we could try to connect to the scope. Sometimes it doesn't reconnect well after I've... Yeah, it, I don't know why that is. You know, I think I'll try to close that. Another thing I often check is to make sure we're still in the same um, Wi-Fi channel. You know, I use a strange way to connect to our um, planetarium software. I use um, an emulator in Windows called BlueStacks, and then open up the Android version of Sky Safari in BlueStacks inside. And I know you're thinking, Doug, just give it up and use Stellarium, Stellarium or something. But I just like Sky Safari better. The info, the info on the objects is just so much better in my opinion. And uh, I know it's kludgy because of this problem of connecting to the scope. But boy, the info on the objects to me is just so much better. 
the, uh, the thing that we use to connect it is called Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi scope. And I wonder sometimes if part of the problem is that interconnecting software is not really being kept up. It was written, it was written by the people at Sequence Generator Pro and they give it away for free. So I don't think they really feel a, a great compulsion to keep it up. So we're not going to be able to connect Sky Safari right now to the mount. So that means we have to search for these manually, but that's okay. NGC 6992. Let's center on that one more time. And so it's supposedly right here, 6995. Yeah, there we are. And what I want to do is I wanted to kind of figure out where is the moon. Let's get rid of that scope thing and ask ourselves, where is the moon? Is that the moon right down here? Is that the moon? That's Jupiter. Here's the moon. Yeah, so that's the moon. So it is still low, but, um, but boy, it's just blinding the whole sky there, isn't it? Let's go back over to SharpCap and see what we've got. You can make it out. Let's do another color balance. And let's manually, let's manually bring the greens down a little. Boy, that didn't help, did it? My uh, Celestron light pollution filter is doing the best it can in this moonlight. So on our, on our race to see a lot of objects tonight, you can see the veil is, is making its arc there, NGC 6992. But boy, it's not going to look as beautiful as on a dark, moonless night. Uh, but at least you can see it, can't you? You can make out the veil nebula. And I guess it's also known as Cirrus Nebula. Now I'm also looking in our scope cam, and sometimes when we see patterns like this, see all those patterns up in the sky, sometimes that means that the scope cam is starting to see either uh, an array of mist or clouds in the sky. But another thing that can mean is that the scope cam itself is starting to uh, pick up dew. And I don't run a dew um, shield, or I don't run a, a dew buster, you know, a, 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 an element to heat up the scope camera at this point. But it looks like on a humid night like tonight, if that is dew on the scope camera, it looks like I'm going to have to. Because our primary camera is not looking very filled with dew, is it? It's just looking moonstruck. Let's bring a little bit off these mids and see if we can get rid of some of that. And let's zoom in on it just a little bit, maybe 40%. NG6-6992. This object was dim enough in the lights of Paris that Messier didn't see it. And you can see he didn't have live stacking on his scope. But you can see why he would have missed it in the city lights of Paris, can't you? But it is, uh, you can start to see a wispy version of it. That's not the best version we've ever had. Let's save a copy of that. And we'll come back to that on a, on a night when it's not so, so moonlit. It's in a good location directly overhead. It's just that at 100% moon, we would have to live stack quite a bit more than nine minutes. All right, let's stop our live stack. And uh, we're trying to do several targets tonight. So let's go to the Gulf of Mexico. How about that? It's NGC 7000. Slewing to coordinates. NGC. Slewing complete. This is another object Messier didn't see. 
in the lights of Paris with his little, whatever his mirror was like, probably a piece of metal, I guess, or I don't know what he was using. Um, we've got our name set up, and you can see how when we first go to a new location, uh, the, the exposure sometimes is just capturing at the moment the scope has landed in its new location. So you can see how sometimes it's like sliding into second base. Those star, those points of light capture the tail as the scope was slewing. You know, they use the word slewing to talk about the movement of the scope. And so the first frame, you kind of have to discard it. Um, so let's go back to our full, uh, this is a, this camera is a, a Z, a ZWO, a ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro. And it is a, a fairly wide frame. I think they call it APS-C is the name of the frame. Very wide. It's about a little over three degrees wide in the sky. So it's pretty wide for an eight-inch telescope. Uh, and this camera can, can see like the entire Andromeda galaxy in one frame without having to create any kind of uh, you know, mosaic piecing together frames. But as a result, uh, it means that you're sometimes backing off of objects that are exotic, like these NGC objects that Messier didn't find. They're, they're, they're not Messier list objects because they weren't dominant enough in the sky for him to see them. Uh, so we started our live stacking process. And again, we're exposing for 30 seconds. So these are time exposures. And the, the big chunk of metal that sits there on top of the tripod, the tripod, you can see it in the little scope cam view if you're new. Uh, the big chunk of metal there is called a mount. And uh, that mount is what sinks us to the to the night sky so we can stay in touch with the night sky and uh, um, so when when astronomers talk when amateurs talk about the mount they mean that machine that's that's moving with the apparent motion of the stars um, so we have a sky watcher mount it's an eq6r pro mount and it's hefty it's a pretty pretty good size mount. Um, we've got five frames now, so let's see what we can do with this. I saw Kim there, who is uh, more experienced than I. Uh, I've been observing for maybe about uh, eight months, something like that. And uh, Kim, I don't know if you get a if you get a moment, tell us how long you've been been observing. I'm trying to get the right color balance here. Boy, it is a mess, isn't it? with this moon and the city lights of Louisville. But I'm going to pull these darks in now. And Kim was saying if you increase the gain uh, and decrease the, the exposure a bit, you might do better at uh, being able to average out that, that um, all that noise from the city lights and the moon and he has a good point now, this is a North American nebula and again it's it's on a very moonlit night that we're seeing it here let's do this color balance one more time now that's the auto balance that it's finding I don't know whether to trust that or not on such a moonlit night. I'll tell you what, while that's stacking, just grabbing a few more frames to average out, let's go back over to our planetarium software and um, 
let's search for NGC 7000. NGC 7000 is a famous North American nebula in Cygnus. This huge cloud in the shape of the familiar earthly continent lies just east of the first magnitude star Deneb. The object can be seen as a distinct brightening of the Milky Way with the unaided eye. The tapered form of the nebula can be spotted in binoculars, or even finder scopes, with 40 millimeter objectives. High power spoils the effect, for the nebula is not small. The Gulf of Mexico region shows dark bays and knots, a relatively starless shores. Here it is believed new stars are forming. The outlines of both coasts of North America can be followed in small telescopes, but with low power. As star parties, it is often asked how large is the nebula in comparison to the real North American continent. If the nebula were reduced to the size of North America, then the Earth, reduced by the same amount, would now be small enough to be completely wrapped up inside a postage stamp. Okay, I don't know if I got his size comparisons or not. Did you? <laughs> I don't know if I understood that. Um, I'm... I'm thinking I'm seeing the North American Nebula there. How about you? But it, it is a stretch. Now, would this be the West Coast? Is that what they're saying? And is this the East Coast? And Florida is down here? Is that the idea? Who named this thing? I I think that takes quite a bit of imagination to be able to see that. And is this, is this part of the Gulf of Mexico? I don't know. Are you... Are you seeing that? Let's see if you're... Oh, there we go. Make sure you're seeing that. So is this the Gulf of Mexico? And is this the West Coast? And is that the East Coast? And this is supposed to be Florida? Because I'm having a little bit of trouble with my imagination seeing all that. Oh my goodness, Kim says, you've been observing for 50 years. Wow. Well, Kim, you have the consummate power to make any suggestions that you ever want to hear. I, I've got seven months uh, and you've been imaging for two years, so it's aw awesome. I don't know, the more I increase this, these mids, the more it brings up all that moonlight. Tell you what, let's, let's try to do a A color balance on the stars. That doesn't work tonight, does it? What happens if we bring the greens down just a hair? Oh, that's promising. Now let's bring the blacks in just right there. Now we're starting to see a little bit less moon. Now to be fair, that is six minutes now also oh wait i got to take you guys over to sharp cap time uh now also we got to remember the rasa has probably flipped this right so are we looking at this is this supposed to be florida or not and, and is this the gulf of mexico so is this who knows Ah, uh -huh. southern skies mostly. Yeah, yeah. We switched to sharp cap screen. Boy, we are starting to see some nice hydrogen alpha reds here. And look the way we're picking up both the darker, the darker hydrogen alpha and then the lighter, dusty hydrogen alpha. Starting to see the shades of pink and dark red. I think you get the idea. Uh, this is... This is so big. I mean, keep in mind, we are at full frame on an APS-C camera. So this is, we're at full three and a half degrees, and it looks like this thing is oozing off the sides. This is a beautiful target. This is beautiful. And on a, on a night when the moon is at 100%, this is just remarkable that we can see anything, if you ask me. I think, Kim, you were right. I think this works better to keep the gain higher and the exposure time a little bit a little bit shorter. Let's go ahead now, since we're trying to see several targets, let's let's save that as seen and stop live stacking. But I, I want to come back to this target when we've got more time. 
And this next one is called the filamentary nebula. Filamentary nebula. NGC 6960. Slewing to coordinates. NGC 6960. Slewing complete. NGC 6960. And boy, what a messy sky we've got tonight. Again, when you slide in with the telescope into that last view and you've just grabbed your last frame, you get those uh, those funny sliding stars, you know, because your telescope is moving. So you have to wait till right there before you can start live stacking. And then you have to remember to clear your live stack here. So while that's accumulating a couple of frames, let's go back to Sky Safari and look at NGC 6960. NGC 6960. NGC 6960. NGC 6960 is one of the most wondrous sights in the sky. This is the Great Veil Nebula in Cygnus. The object is a huge arc of light several degrees in diameter and caused by the explosion of a star tens of thousands of years ago. In a large telescope, the veil is like a white river running through a black canyon seen at dusk. The veil's densest portion is at the star 52 Cygni, which looks like a golden lantern tossed into the waves and flickering feebly below. Observationally, the veil has a reputation of being a difficult object. But times and attitudes change. Since the object is very large, it can be seen by 7x50 binoculars. Small telescopes, equipped with modern accessories, can also spot the veil in a field that a filter has darkened. Low power is best for this object. The sky must be moonless and without the unwanted rays of streetlights. All that done, the veil can be viewed with a 90mm telescope. Okay, folks, there you heard it. To see this object, the sky has to be moonless, and you can't be near the lights of the city. Now, this 6960, somebody help me out that's got their browser open, if you don't mind. Would this be the Western Veil? And what we just saw, 7,000, would that be the Eastern Veil? Is that the way? Or not, not 7,000, 6992. So is 6992 the Eastern Veil and is 6960 the Western Veil? Is that the way they're set up? Um, we need to settle this for sure. Let's go back to Sharp Cap and let's do, let's make sure our, our display histogram is reset. Let's reset this live and do a color balance. Wow, look how strange that color balance is tonight. All those different colors. Boy, I can already see it just barely oozing out there. Can you let's put let's bring down our greens again. I think that was a secret last time. When we brought down the greens Might not hurt for us to zoom in just to 25% here. Correct. Frank says correct. So let's go back to Astral Planner and I've just typed this in 6960. We're now going to have that. See, I've, I've typed in down here. Did I? Sixty-nine, sixty. Boy, I can't see the way they've got this set up. How can I see? Uh, maybe I'll just go here to the beginning of it because I think Western Veil vale is what we want to remember it as. I think that's a lot more common name than filamentary. So 6960, you're thinking... Is limit the warning. Uh-oh, limit warning. So what that means is we're very close to the uh, 10 degrees past the meridian. 
we'll have to flip the telescope. You know, I'd like to experiment with this while we're here. What does this mean, flip SOP, flip side up here? We can't do this while we're live stacking, but let's just quickly finish our live stack. I tell you what, it is a very faint object, isn't it? But I hope you can see it starting to show up there in the middle. The Western Veil Nebula, NGC 6960. Has to be a moonless night, and you have to be away from the street lights, and we are neither. But look at that coming out. In four minutes and 40 seconds, you can capture the Western Veil. Now, I don't know if you're able to see that much in your, you know, in the YouTube version or not, but here live, that is starting to be quite a sight. Let's zoom in a little more. Look at that. I don't know what the ideal zoom is, but look at the filaments. Now you see why they call it the filamentary nebula. That's not, actually not a bad name for it. Look at all those filaments. All right, let's save a scene because tonight we're trying to cover several objects and not spend forever on one, but in five minutes, the fact that we can see that is to me fascinating. Now I'll tell you why part of this works. It's because the Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph Telescope, it's not really a telescope because you can't put a, an eyepiece on it. It's designed to capture a lot of light um, in, in, a, in a very quick way. Um, it, it drinks in the light. And astronomers call it a fast telescope. It's F2. And that's quite a contrast with some of the other telescopes that are like F10. In fact, it, it might be, you know, 50 times faster than some telescopes. And that's why we're getting this so quickly. I bet you to do this justice on the average F10 t telescope, we might have to camp out here for, you know, two hours. And I don't even know on a, on, a, on a night with a full moon if we'd be able to see this much. So, you know, I'm spoiled because this is the only telescope I've, to be honest, the only telescope I've ever worked with much. I had an F10 scope and I, I sure couldn't do this, I'll tell you that much. And I had that scope for about a month in this modern epic and I realized it was not working in the city lights of Louisville. Okay, so we're gonna stop this live stack and push on, but that is a beautiful picture. Let's go back to our Astro Planner now, and I just want to say here a new observation and say, um, wow, in spite of, of a full moon and Bortle 6, this F two scope saw the western veil amazing in five minutes flat um, I think it's a real commercial it, this is a real commercial for Harasa telescope <laughs> let's go to the dumbbell nebula and this is a beautiful nebula you guys have all Slewing to coordinates. I wonder if we'll straighten out the pier. Maybe we should abort this. Abort. Slew. And here's what we want to do is go back here to the... Because I don't think it automatically figured out that it needed to flip... Hmm. Well, it, it looks like it's not. Let's try it again. Slewing to coordinates. Pier east. Oh, there it went. It flipped by itself. 
I guess it just figured that out. But, you know, it gave you the limit warning. And I wonder if at the end of the limit warning, you guys who have more experience, does it finally just stop? Or does it actually start crashing into the side of the tripod? That's, that's my question. You're battling light pollution, severe moonlight, all of which is noise, a hydrogen alpha. Slewing complete. Three filter like the Optolong L Extreme would do wonders under these conditions. I bet you're right. But I will say this, uh, Kim. In an object like the one we're about to look at, I think those filters would not allow us to be able to enjoy the colors like we can on this object. Um, that's my theory. With the Rasa also, remember that so far with the camera holder I have from Octopi Astro, and I'm using a beta version, the only one that's out so far from Octopi Astro to be able to adjust for this tilt and, and uh, this uh, back focus um, field curvature that we had, you can't put filters in. So there's only one place for a filter and it, it does not accommodate normal two inch filters. So it's a very rare situation. So I just leave the Celestron light pollution filter in and I just leave it the whole time. And it notches out about four kinds of light pollution. Sinking to coordinates. It doesn't do Slewing uh, to coordinates. Slewing complete. Nebula like you're talking about, Kim. So we were 0.5 degrees off. We probably didn't have to correct for that, but I thought, well, you know, it's it's flipped the pier, so let's make sure we're still on track. And I think it did do a bit of a correction. 0.5 degrees in a three degree field of view, that is gonna be something. It, yeah, see, it it's centered M27 for us. So let's change our name here to M27 and Let's let's just go ahead and I wonder let's just go ahead and start our live stacking at that and clear our last live stack. And then while that's accumulating a frame or two, let's go learn about M twenty seven. This is a this is a really, I got to say, a popular object. Um, M27 is a famous dumbbell nebula in Volpecula, or the Little Fox. Few deep sky objects are as mysterious and appealing as M27. It is a planetary nebula or cloud of gas being evolved by a star. M27 looks like a small elliptical cloud, quite bright in binoculars. Small telescopes reveal the two lobes, which is how the dumbbell got its name. Still larger scopes show an empty portion near the middle that is filled with a faint gas. What is the major axis is now seen to be the minor axis of a larger ellipse of faint blue gas. M27 is one of the larger planetary nebula. The name was selected by Herschel and was based on his observation that these look like the faded disks of planets. Of course, there's no real connection with planets. It's just a name that stuck. This Hubble image. Boy, I wish I had the Hubble out here in this field. That is amazing, isn't it? Look at those little, those little bitty cloud things. I guess those are he calls them knots there. Local photo ionization fronts. <laughs> so I guess this whole thing would be patches of different colored, different kinds of gas that are being lit up and ionized. And wouldn't the, um, wouldn't the red sections be uh, oxygen sections and the greenish blue sections or the, the red would be hydrogen sections, the greenish blue would be oxygen sections, right? Let's go back over to SharpCap and see what we can milk out of this on this um, moon-filled night. 
we have two minutes of exposure so far. So let's do a, a color balance. And in keeping with what we've been doing, now see, I don't think we're going to have to bring the greens down on this, but let's see. Yeah. I don't think we're going to have to. Maybe we can try to bring the greens down just a dash. And then... Mids. Now let's zoom in. You know, um, I was in um, Missouri today. Um, quite a ways down in Missouri. And didn't get to leave as early as I would have liked. And while I was on my way home, I decided to do this tonight, this this observing imaging EAA session, whatever you want to call it. And when I set the time on it, I thought I was using Eastern time, but unfortunately as a schoolboy error, I was I was still looking at my watch, which I had set my watch to central time. And so I didn't give myself a full extra hour to work out all the bugs. So we can do better than this on our focus. Um, you can see here, we, we actually could improve our focus here on this. But if you don't look at the stars as much, and instead you look at this small target here in the middle, you can already see the things that the narration was talking about. These reddish hydrogen sections and those greenish oxygen sessions, sections. And then in here are where those knots are, where you have the photo ionization of those different fronts happening. But you can also see why this is sometimes called the apple core. Doesn't it look like an apple core? Or alternatively, you can see why somebody would call it a dumbbell nebula because it does look like a bit like a dumbbell. I think it's amazing that in four minutes we can see this kind of a thing. Now, Kim, tell me if I'm right. If we used too narrow of a band filter, wouldn't it restrict us? on some of these colors, I, I I thought it would restrict us on some of these. Whereas by just using this light pollution filter, it does let us see, I think. Now look up here. This is where he was talking about, if you do look at it a little more closely, you, you begin to see some of those lighter um, wisps that are being spewed out. And those lighter wisps are hard to pick up on, I think, in any scope. The fact that we're seeing them here after five minutes, again, to me, is, is pretty amazing. So we're going to um, grab a picture of this because we're trying to see a lot of targets and we're going to push on. But this is a target we, we ought to come back to again and again on dark nights. When, when we've got tight, tight focus set, let's remember this because this is a beautiful object. Um, we'll want to come back to this again and again. All right, back to our targeting software. That's M27. Uh, that was a planetary nebula that's, that's blowing up. Now let's go to M57, the ring nebula. Slewing to coordinates. And again, Slewing complete. the ring nebula is also very, very popular because, again, it is a very unique object. Let's see, we want to change this to M57. What SharpCap does, if you do change your, your name of your object, it does save the name of the object with the picture. So that's handy. Wow, look at that. This is a, a live shot, one exposure, and it's already, it's already looking at that. But I, I am not liking our focus. Now, we're at 100%. This is a tiny, 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 tiny object. And we are zoomed in at 100%, but this does show us that coming back from Missouri in a hurry, you know what we ought to do, gang? We ought to do, we ought to just take a moment. Let's see how Frank said we started at 1150. 
and it is 1 a.m. now. I don't know. Oh, Kim says, let me read a little bit about this. Frank says, Elex Dream is specifically designed to let H-alpha and O3 band pass. So both of them, Frank says, although with the speed of the ROFs, you'd be better off with the IDAS NBZ, which accounts for the spectral shift. And Kim says, narrowband imaging will require longer exposures for emission nebula, but image will stand out much better from background noise compared to light pollution filter. I got you. I was just thinking, guys, before we live stack this, and I know, Frank, it's getting too late for you. You got to go to bed. You're in Eastern time zone. Kim, good point, Frank. Need to be careful to select appropriate MB filters for us. It's good. But I'm thinking, let's go to Nina for a second. And let's just do a quick focus so that we see Nina in action also. That might be fun. Uh, I'm going to go back to Sharp Cap because what we have to do is remember to disconnect our camera here. And then in Nina, we find Nina. Um, for you. Okay, so the first thing we want to do in Nina is um, go to what options? No equipment, and we want to say connect to the 2600, and then we want to say focuser. Ah, it's not going to be able to connect to that. And I'll tell you why. Because SharpCap has grabbed control of the focuser. So what we're literally going to do is we're going to, I'll leave that window, we're going to close SharpCap so it lets go of the focuser. Now back in Nina, see, if Sharp Cap has grabbed hold of the focuser, it won't let anybody else have it. And so we have to close Sharp Cap so we can open it in Nina. Now in Nina, we'll go to um, imaging and let's just look at our options real quick. Just want to review these options. Where do we find our focuser options? Let's see. Not there. Options. <sighs> Equipment. Focuser settings already connected. Just hit OK. That's not what we want. We want Nina's. Ah, oh, here we go. Here we go. This is what we wanted. Uh, we have. Frank says I got the NBZ when I use Hyperstar. Okay. You know, that MBZ filter, I remember that, Frank, and I bet you had to, like, sell sell a used car to buy that. Isn't that, like, is that the one that's $1,000, or is that the one that's just 300 Anyway, that's an expensive filter. I'm going to have to save a lot. This Celestron light pollution filter was, like, 160 and I thought that was crazy. Uh, so what we've got here is five initial offset steps. That means it's going to go five steps in either direction. It's using the half flux radius. It's using trends and hyperbolic, which I think works better, uh, in my opinion. It tries twice at each setting. Now, we might be able to save some time and do that once. Uh, brightest 10 stars. We've got this crop ratio set at one, but I think, is this the one that we 
see the outer crop. The inner crop is the one we want set on 0.5. And if we set the inner crop on 0.5, then with a with a, a camera like mine that's APS-C, $300. Okay, well, that's not as bad as the $1,000 one. Um, if we set the inner crop ratio on 0.5, it just uses the middle third or so of the APS-C frame. And I found that works better for me because I was getting that. I still get the slightest little, not very much now, the slightest little star elongation out at the edges. So I think the focus works better to say 0.5 here, one bidding one, and here. I have zero backlash, and I don't know. Let's try setting these on 20 this time, because I got a little bit of a weird curve last time. So I'm just guessing. OK, with those settings, let's go back to imaging and say start autofocus. And now if you tuned into this because you just wanted to see the beauty of these objects, then this, this portion that has to do with the craft of astronomy, this might not be as interesting to you. Um, but, but boy, for, for us. Now, I'm trying to think, though. We are looking right now at, at a nebula. So I wonder how that's going to affect the focus Boy, you know what? I think what we're going to do is cancel this and go back and find a more normal part of the sky. Um, because honestly, I think if we're zeroed in on, oh wait, it's a very tiny object. So maybe, maybe it won't matter. Let's do it anyway. Let's try it anyway. The, the fact that the object is so tiny I don't know. Last time when I did autofocus, it worked really well. And I used a part of the sky. Um, let me find the star that I use now as my star to find. I just use this as my landmark. HD192911. HD192911. While that's auto-focusing, and it'll make the curve there without us. You can see it's it's already started there. Let's let that find a couple of points. I'll go show you in the in um Guy Safari, HD, HD 192.911. Um, now look what the Rasa sees here. Nothing but that. In other words, what I try to find is a star field that was rich in stars with no outlandishly bright stars, like, you know, a Vega or something. And I try to find one that was fairly balanced in the corners and around, you know, so that it was fairly even. And it worked the best. And I think that is probably the best idea to find a field like that. So I'm curious, and we won't know, will we, till we, till we see the results of this. Let's go back to Nina now and watch it at work. Actually, that's not, that's not a bad start, is it? Again, if you, if you tuned in to see the beauty of the night sky, then you aren't very interested in this part, but if you are an amateur astronomer, and if you have not tried Nina's autofocusing routine yet, it is worth it. It is worth trying. Now, you do have to tune it to your scope and your focus motor, and I'm still working on that, to be honest. But um, 
Boy, I'm a lot farther along than I was. And another thing you have to remember is you have to start close. I mean, you can't just install your focus motor and have it be on stop number zero and then use this right out of the gate. You have to visually focus so you can see stars and they have to be fairly close points of light before you introduce Nina's autofocus routine. The settings are really important, gang. Um, the backlash settings are important. I Early on, I, I didn't, uh, I had too much backlash. Another setting that's important is to use this, this trends and hyperbolic. There are about six different ways you can you can search you know, that you can do autofocusing. The other, I think the half flux radius is the best. Look at it, it's already, it's already headed back up, which is just to me amazing. Now you might wonder, Doug, why don't you just focus using your eyes? But what I'm telling you is this routine in Nina is completely run by math rather than by visual. And with a scope like Arasa, which has a critical focus zone of just 11 microns, like 11, what is that? Is that 11 thousandths of a millimeter? Um, with, a, with a telescope that has such a fast focal ratio as F2, the critical focus zone is so small I dare you to try to focus this visually and have it work. When you use star math, now what it's doing here is it's, it's measuring the illumination of half of the radius of the stars that it has chosen. And it has chosen the ten brightest stars and it's, it's measuring, it's taking half of the radius and then scoping out the illumination of that and then it's moving like 20 stops and then it's using look at the way it's using these oh what are those called when it's using a an averaging routine um, what it's using is math to focus your telescope and I love that idea I tried the Botanoff mask and I'm convinced, gang, with a Rasa, it's hopeless. You, I dare you, you cannot visually focus a Rasa with a Botanoff mask. You just can't do it. But using this math, I mean, look at that curve. To me, this is like a work of art. And I tell you, the guy who programmed this, if I can get him to watch this portion of this video so that he knows how thankful I am for him, with a Rasa telescope, this is my salvation. Having this subroutine, uh, having this ability to be able to focus a telescope with pure math, I think is amazing. So it's finished. And uh, now let's go back to our options. And let's, uh, I'm sorry, back to our equipment and disconnect the focuser. And then go back to the camera and disconnect the camera. Now let's um, open sharp cap again. And now I'm going to help you find that in your screen. Okay, you did again. Um, camera's connected. We're going to put in the target name, which is, we are still on M57. And um, we are 
we're going to begin live stacking. So that can be working on a frame. Now let's zero in at 100%. I think that's much tighter. Look at the, look at all the tiny, tiny pinpoints now. And do you remember when we were looking at this a while ago, look at how on the opening frame, look, we can already see the center point of this planetary nebula on the opening frame. I'm telling you, this Nina autofocus routine nails it. Even with a Rasa, it nails it. Uh, okay, M57. Now we've done our commercial on Nina autofocusing. <laughs> Let's listen to the tour of um, M57. M57 is a famous ring nebula, one of the most often seen objects in the sky and the one most requested at gatherings of amateur astronomers. The ring is a sight of haunting beauty and always brings out oohs and ahs from people at the eyepiece. M57 appears as a hoop or donut, usually whitish, but some eyes may see it as greenish. In small telescopes, the center appears empty, but in larger instruments, it can be seen that the middle is occupied with a thin haze. The object is easy to find, located between Beta and Gamma Lyra, the two stars at the foot of the harp. The ring's small apparent size makes it often invisible in the finder scope, a source of confusion to beginners. A minimum of about 15 power is required to see M57. Although the ring appears fragile and small, it is worth remembering that the true size of M57 is about 45,000 astronomical units across. This is about 1,000 times the radius of our solar system. So it's a tiny, tiny object. I tell you what we got to save up for, guys. Frank and Kim and um, Jim and Joe and Kana. Guys, we got to save up and get a telescope like the Hubble. Wouldn't that be fun? That's just beautiful, isn't it? Let's go back over on a near 100% night. Look at that. I'm amazed at that. Okay, so we're going to this color balance the best we can and we're gonna set our darks right there I tell you guys it's amazing <laughs> you know I liked having that jet black sky didn't you I think that helped seeing that Contrast. That middle star, you can see it. I hope you're able to zoom in. I wonder if, does this help when I do this? It doesn't, does it? it? Doesn't make your screen any bigger, it just gets rid of the sidebars. I don't know if that's that helpful or not. Um, let's cheat a little bit. Now, we, when we go above 100%, we'll start seeing pixelation. See that pixelation? Yeah, that's just not pretty. So this is the best we can do on a, on a Rasa, but it's still beautiful, even though it's teeny tiny. You can see the colors on the edges, look at the reds, and then look at how you start to see the yellows in the middle. I mean, uh, the yellow like uh, the ring, and then look at the green in the middle, and then the tiny little star pinpoint in the middle of that. Four minutes. It's amazing. This gain has turned way up to 300, too. You have to wonder what it would add on a dark night if we could go, you know, 45 seconds or something on this and bring that gain down to 100. 
I'm loving this. I'm loving this. <laughs> okay, let's um, let's grab a picture of that. Stop the live stacking. Go back to auto. Let's do the cat eye. Slewing to coordinates. NGC sixty five forty three. Slewing complete. NGC 6543. We're going to have to really scramble in this next 30 minutes. Frank says, looks really good. Kim says, wonderful. Woohoo! <laughs> you guys are nice to encourage. Um, we're going to have to really scramble if we're going to get through even what 10 more targets we're gonna have to scramble fast um so let's live stack here clear ngc It's another planetary nebula, huh? Hmm. NGC 6543 is a famous cat's eye nebula, a small but easily seen planetary nebula in Draco. The object appears to be like an out of focus star and about as big as the disk of the planet Saturn. It's visible in an 80 millimeter scope and may appear slightly bluish in color. In 250 millimeter telescopes and at higher power, a mottled and indistinct appearance takes place on the uniform disk. Very large telescopes and instruments in space have shown this object has complex layers inside the outer edge. It's a cauldron of activity, but frozen from our view as the action goes on, apparently in slow motion. We want Hubble. We want Hubble. <laughs> It looks like what they've done there is they've they've taken like three or four images in a row a pattern of at least 11 concentric shells the star ejected its mass in a series of pulses at 1500 year intervals and these convulsions created dust shells, each containing as much mass as all the planets in our solar system combined. About a thousand years ago, the pattern changed and it started forming a nebula inside the dusty shells, and it's been expanding ever since. That's just Back to sharp cap. Look at that. It does look like a tiny point of light. That's crazy. That's nuts. This is the wrong telescope for this object. <laughs> Let's see what we can pull out here. Where is it? Is that it? Wow, it looks like I'm overexposing it, doesn't it? I am. We are way overexposing this. Let's drop this down to maybe 100. And set this back on 30 seconds. And see if we can pull out any of the other detail. So much for my, we really got to hustle if we're going to see any detail in this, I mean, we just, we're blowing that. We just blew out the middle of that. That's a 100% gang. This is NGC 6543, the Cat Eye Nebula. Well, if there's any consolation, look at the image that the General All Sky gives us. 
It's a picture of a blowing out eye. It's exactly what we're it's exactly what we're seeing. So short of having the Hubble telescope out there in our field. Well, that's nice. This is Jim Misty. You guys heard of Jim Misty before? It seems like every time I come across a picture by Jim Misty, I'm fascinated by it. I think I saw a picture of Jim Misty taking pictures. And I don't know what size his scope was, but I mean, it looked huge. I mean, it, it had to be 24 inches. We need a bigger aperture, guys. We got to go for a bigger aperture. Just kidding. But 11 inch Rasa would be nice. Well, I think we'd already done so much damage. Wait, maybe we can tune something up here. No. It just blew it out of the sky. I'm going to save a copy of this and then just do one more thing. Let's keep this at 30. And let's clear this and just see what the first couple of images bring in. Cat Eye Nebula. <clears throat> In an observation window on this, I'm going to say we image this at 20 seconds and 300 gain, and it was blown out back down to 30 seconds at 100 gain. And we could at least see color. See how now it's it's a little bit greenish. At least we can see color now. It looks like we're starting to see a little bit That was in livestock. That was live. So let's live stack two or three of these images. Uh, it's still going to be too bright, I think. Let's let's hold up. Let's take this to um, zero gain and leave it at thirty seconds, I think. Because it is, it is blowing it out, I think. I think we want to be, oh yeah, see already with the live image there that's not stacked. That already looks better. Twenty minutes left. Boy, once we got focused. Once we beat this silly plugging in the cable correctly, let's get two subframes here and then let's uh, color balance this again. Bring the blacks over. Yeah, see how green that looks now? Boy, if you bring those mids over at all, it just blows it out. This is a unique object to, to observe, isn't it? The Hubble image is better. <laughs> but you know, like right there, you're at least seeing it's got some green stuff going on inside of it. I see what they mean is about the size of Saturn.
it's crazy because the um, the little wisps inside of it are dimmer than the overall surface brightness of it. <laughs> Kim, you've probably got a telescope that you can really magnify this, I bet. Because you've got, if I remember right, you've got a nice, um, what, is, what is the make? Is, is it a explore scientific or something like that? You're... Forget what your what your high magnification telescope is. Anyway, I bet it does well on this object. I'm just going to save this and we'll push on because we're trying to do multiple objects tonight. But look at that. It does look like a green Saturn now. Okay, we're going to stop live stacking. And go back to, wait, inner observation. Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's go back to Astro Planner. And what is this next thing? What is H? Oh, it's a double star. This will be a fast one. Let's just do this real quick. Slewing to coordinates. HR 424. Pier West. Slewing complete. What I was trying to do tonight is I was trying to get like I was trying to find several different kinds of objects so we had a kind of a good mixture of things HR 424 and this was in a list I found oh look HR 424 you know what else is known as Polaris! <laughs> uh, what I thought we would do is just notice that Polaris is a double star if we can split it. Let's go back to Sharp Cap. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to be able to split it. Look. Let's come down to um, 20 seconds. Might be able to do it less than that. Drum roll. Yeah, that's still too much. Five seconds. Because what I want to do is keep the main part from just blowing out. There we go. See how it's a double star? And the secondary is just dim now, huh? Let's go with 10 seconds, zero gain. Yeah. There you go. Can you see that in the YouTube? Oh, a Williams Optics 80 millimeter refractor. See, I bet you could do a good job on that tiny, tiny cat eye thing. And then you've got a Celestron 9, 9 and a quarter STT. That's a good, that's a good pair of scopes. You, you can do well on, and if you put a, um, a, a wide field, what do you call it? reducer? A reducer on the Celestron. Then I bet you see a wide field on it too. Nice. Anyway, I just thought this was cool to be able to notice that it was a double.
And it's not like, you know, there's anything fancy about it. But I just thought, you know, a lot of people get a big kick out of observing doubles, don't they? Observe that Polaris is actually a double. And you know, doubles can be um, orbiting in such a way that they're that we're in the orbital plane, and so we um, notice it getting dimmer. Slewing to co periods. One star goes behind another and eclipses it, or they can they can be top. On for us in GC 6818. Um, in GC 6818. A lot of people get a big kick out of observing doubles. Slewing complete. Shall we go back up to our 20 seconds? 300 gain. Something like that. Now notice we're not seeing all that funny patterning in our scope cam. So I don't think that was due. I think it was some clouds in the sky or fog. But whatever it is, it's gone. Look, it's clear as a bell now. All right, let's go back out to um, full frame. And start live stacking, I guess. NGC 6818. NGC 6818. Little Jim Nebula. Oh, it's Planetary Nebula Night is a small, bright planetary nebula in the constellation Sagittarius, discovered by William Herschel. Again, this is another one that that um, Messier couldn't see. It's 22 arc seconds wide. <laughs> Imagine what that's going to look like <laughs> in a three and a half degree wide rich field telescope, wide field telescope. It has a spherical outer region and a brighter vice-shaped interior bubble. And the tiny, tiny star in the middle that's illuminating it is a tiny blue dot. A fast stellar wind from that central star is thought to have created the elongated shape of the inner region. The wind is traveling so fast that it smashes through older, slower moving stellar debris causing a blowout at both ends of the bubble. How does that work? Because the, the stellar wind is coming out of the ends of the little star 6,000 light years away. Oh, astrophysics. Uh-oh. This is not stacking. What does that mean? We don't have enough stars visible. We gotta go to 30 seconds. Right? Hmm. This looks like it's not pointed at the tree line. It's high enough, 28 degrees. That's not super high. Still. Maybe because this thing hadn't been reset correctly. Oh, it's because the moon is there. The moon is in the way of this object. Let's go back to uh, Sky Safari. And let's center on it. 
<laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, wait, no. Where is the moon? Is that the moon? No, that's Saturn. So what's the problem? Sixty-eight eighteen. What is that incredibly bright light? Too much exposure. That's what that is. Mm. Still too much exposure? Crazy. You guys are talking about uh, guide scope or off-axis guiding. Kim uses a 280 guide scope, two times Barlow. Got it. Oh, this is much better now. Okay, so let's do the color balance. Still a funny um, still a very funny weird histogram, isn't it? Everything's compressed over here. The whites are clipping. Okay, let's go ahead and go to 100%. And there's that little gym. Boy, we better be glad we did focus a while ago. Okay, you know what you can see after three minutes? You can see two tones in that thing. At least I can here. I don't know if, and I wonder if in YouTube if you're seeing that. Oh, you're not seeing much of anything in Sharp Cop. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be able to see that or not on the YouTube channel. Wow, yeah, you can see now after three minutes and 40 seconds, we are definitely seeing two tones. The Little Gym, NGC 6818 Planetary Nebula. It's Planetary Nebula Night. It's Planetary Nebula Night. Da 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 da. It's Planetary Nebula Night. We're going to have to come back to this when we have a Hubble telescope. <laughs> 6818. NGC 6818. NGC 6818. There's a globular cluster. It might be in the same frame. 6822. Let's look at the whole frame here real quick. Not seeing it. All right. Let's stop that live stack and for our last image, and then it's going to be two hour warning. 
Let's go to um, slewing to coordinates. If we're still slewing going. complete. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be overexposed too. You know? Look at that. Oh, look, we're seeing some moon action. How many moons is it that Saturn has? Like 60, some crazy number. 750 milliseconds. So we can see the moons. Let's look at the moons first. Look at that. We're seeing three moons in a row. We're seeing one there. I wonder if that's a moon. Let's go over to um, Sky Safari and search for Saturn and center on that. Yeah, look, that's uh, Rhea and Tethys and Dion. So the three in a row are Rhea, Tethys, Dion. Where are we now? Back to sharp cap. Rhea, Tethys, Dion. Which are the two that are slightly closer together? That's Dion and Tethys. So these two that are closer together, this is Dion and that's Tethys and that's Rhea. Those three moons in a row. And then see. We go out to this. Ah, oh, there's Titan. This is Titan. And let's see. I wonder if we got to back off to 75. Maybe go with one second to see. Hmm. We go out and then at a 45 degree angle. No. Those are just background stars. And this is also a background star. But this is Hyperion. Look at that. The moon Hyperion. And let's just double that see if we can see any other moons. Oh, yeah. More stuff. There's one there, for instance. That one is Yap Yapetus. Yapetus. So that's Yapetus. Yapetus? Is that the way you say that? And then, interestingly, Beside Titan, there's another moon, and that's, oh no, that's a background star. So you can almost see that background star be, beside Titan. 
That's awesome. How many moons does Saturn have for Pete's sake? Sure has a lot. Anyway, now we're overexposing Saturn. But I don't know what we'd have to get down to to see the rings. That's close. Yeah, there we go. Good uh, I don't know if because of seeing, I don't know if seeing will allow us to be able to see those rings or not. Look at that, five milliseconds. Well, I think, um, Kim, you're... Um, Williams optics, William optics, 80 millimeter refractor would be a better, a better um, fit here for this object, but that's Saturn. Yeah, it's not, it's not doing well on aligning those. Not a, there you go. Such as it is, you can start to see some separation between the ring and the and the planet. Well, so summing up, um, we did not make it through 20 objects, did we? But we did cover more than what we'd been covering. So I like this pace a lot better. Um, I think I was spinning too long on objects. Um, let's highlight the, how do we tell the ones that we observed tonight? We did that veil, we did that North America, Western veil, dumbbell, ring, cat, the double star, that's seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, We tried on a couple of these, but they were already setting. So we did 11 objects in about an hour and a half. And then the other half hour, we wasted on, we didn't waste, but we had to do the autofocus routine and just getting started. So, you know, obviously with my little central time zone um, mix up, not allowing myself enough time to get things settled, it meant that I was forcing myself into a, about a 40-minute setup time, and it was just too much to do. But, you know, I've ordered an observatory. It's an Explorer Dome. It's going to go right out there, and this stuff is all going out in it for keeps so that we don't have to set it up every time. So I'm happy with that. When we do that, we're going to go with fiber between here and there uh, because you're not allowed in the city of Louisville to run metal cat seven in the same conduit as your power line they have to be separated and it would cost more so we're going to run fiber out to the observatory be able to operate it from here uh 200 feet away and uh oh i'm looking forward to that getting getting it set up so we have no set of time and no tear down when i'm done tonight when i do finish it'll be another 35 or 40 minutes tearing everything down again and it'll just be covered in dew, all that humidity and moisture, just soaking wet. And with the observatory, it's fully automated, supposedly, when we get it done. Aperture closes. And hopefully, Lord willing, that'll be set. So remember that these objects are always up there in the sky. Um, if you've encountered some troubling times 
in the past year. Our heart aches for you. Maybe your troubling times were health in nature or political in nature, or maybe you've been watching what's happening in Afghanistan and your heart goes out to the people there that can't get on those planes yet. I thought we should go ahead and do this tonight just to show these objects are always there. They're stable. And I hope you can find something like that to be your anchor. With me personally, it ends up being God being my anchor. And I hope you can find that because it is a topsy-turvy crazy world right now. Don't forget to subscribe if you like content like this. And if you thought it was worth it, give it a thumbs up. Uh, it's a free thing you can do to help out the channel to grow for whatever that's worth. Thank you for being a part of this. I hope if you didn't watch it live that you were able to see it recorded. And uh, sorry for the late start. Next time we'll try not to mix up the start time and allow more time so we'll get those bugs worked out before it's time to click it on. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to our guests here, people like Frank and Kim. Kim says the Williams Optics 80 with reducer has about the same. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the longer focal length, yeah, the um, the cast would work better, wouldn't it, for the, for the smaller objects. You're right. Okay, well, I'm going to say good night. Thank you all for being with us, Frank. You know, appreciate you always up there in Schenectady. Kim down there in Australia. And uh, also the others that jumped in as well. People like uh, Jim and Joe and Kana. Thank you all for being a part. God bless and good night from Emerald Hills. See you.